so that we honor him in all that we do. Amen. Uh, a couple of uh, announcements I want to mention. First of all, tomorrow night is going to be our Women's Ministries Fellowship. Normally it's on Tuesdays, but um, because of the Go Rally, which is my next announcement, uh, we are going to be having our Women's Ministries Fellowship tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock at the Life Center, and we just ask you all to bring a finger food and, and a friend and that kind of thing. It's going to be a great time. You always have uh, such a wonderful time together. I do want to mention that because of homecoming, which is next Sunday, that we will not have men's ministries for September because uh, they're going to be setting up and that sort of thing. So we will pick that back up in October, men. But you'll be all right because I'm sure you'll eat between now and then. It'll be okay. Um, today at 5 o'clock, we have our first Christmas cantata practice. You might be saying, but it's September. But we, don't, we aren't going to meet every day to practice, so we need more time. But uh, if you are interested in being in the cantata, and you might say, oh, I can't sing. Don't worry. We had plenty of people in the one last year that couldn't <laughs> sing. So anyway, uh, but if, if you just want to be a part of it, and I'll let you all figure out which ones couldn't sing. But if you, if you want to be a part of the cantata, if you can be here today at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a listen through. All we're going to do is I'll give you your music and then we'll just listen through the whole cantata. And then uh, beginning the week after homecoming, we'll begin to practice uh, on Sunday afternoon. So if you want to be a part of that, come out today and uh, see what it is we're going to do. Because before you know it, Christmas is going to be here. So um, it, it, it's frightening. How many of you started Christmas shopping already? Oh, my Lord, there's actually people that have. What is wrong with you people? Anyway, no, uh, no, that's fine. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, uh, let me know if you need my sizes. All right, so um, moving along from there, we also want to mention, as I said, next Sunday is homecoming. And we're going to have uh, the musical group Atoned is going to be with us. We are going to start at 1030. Everybody say 1030. 1030. Not at 11. We will not have Sunday school. We will start at 1030, and then after the service, we're going to go eat until everybody is ready to throw up, and then you'll bring home to go place as well. So uh, that's going to be next Sunday. Make sure that you let people know so they can come out and be a part, and uh, if there's people that maybe they haven't been to church in a while, tell them it's homecoming, so come on home. Now's the time for you to do that, and have them come out. That's going to be next Sunday. It's going to be a wonderful time, our 119th homecoming for Oak Grove. How many of you were here for the first one? That's Yeah, Bonnie was. Okay, so <laughs> anyway, that's why you got to listen to the whole thing before you raise your hand. All right, so anyway, I did also want to mention, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, a little bit more, uh, uh, but I did want to mention the global outreach. Uh, the Go Rally is going to be this Tuesday at 7 o'clock. That'll be a New Beginnings Worship Center. It's on 17A on the way to Somerville. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, I'll get it out. There we go. Last thing I wanted to mention before we move forward is that we are having a water baptism opportunity on Sunday, October 6th. If you are interested in being baptized in water for the first time, or even if it's a matter of where you're wanting to be baptized because you feel like you're at a new place in your life with Christ and you want to renew that commitment, I'm, I'm fine with you doing that as well. Just come and see me and let me know. I know we've got at least three or four already that are going to be getting baptized, and so uh, just excited. Anytime we get to do that, that, that's showing that we're growing spiritually, amen? So uh, that's going to be on October 6th. Just let me know if you are interested in doing that. All right, today is Grandparents Day. How many grandparents we have out there? Let's give all of our grandparents a hand. Whether you are Mima or Mimi or Mama or Nanny or Nana, or the old lady who yells at me a lot. Whatever it is that you are, and, and same with the guys, uh, we just are so grateful for each and every one of our grandparents. And so what we're going to do, my lovely wife is going to come. She just had a birthday yesterday, by the way. And, um, and yet still doesn't look a day older. All right, so anyway. Uh, but uh, we are going to draw some names. If, you, if your name is drawn and you are not here, you don't win. We don't play that way, because otherwise I'll, I'll take the card home and forget to give it to you and all that kind of stuff. That's bad. So we're going to draw a, a few names here, and if you are not a grandparent, your name gets drawn. Don't pretend like you're a grandparent. Say, oh, yeah, sure, one day. All right, so anyway, let's see what we can get here. We, oh, well, you're going to throw that one on the ground. We got Jane Ackerman right over here. Give her a hand. 
I need my help here. We got, we've got young men because these are grandparents. So we've got young men that are going to bring these to you. So who's our next one? Greg Hood is not here. See, Greg, that's what you get. No. <laughs> Millie Mills. Millie Mills is here. <laughs> Lift up your hand, Ms. Millie Mills, because he may not know who you are. He should. He's been here longer than I have. Are you serious? <laughs> Y'all paid your tithe this week, didn't you? <laughs> How did that happen? What? Okay, anyway, but we're, we're just so grateful for all of our grandparents. Um, I actually, uh, sad story, I did not know my grandparents. I never had the joy of being able to go to Grandma and Grandpa's house and all that sort of thing. So. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Anyway, no, but it's, I'm just so grateful because uh, I see the grandparents that are around their grandkids and the way that they're helping to raise those kids and the way that they're, uh, they're being an example to them. And I'm just thankful for every one of our grandparents that are showing your, your grandchildren how to be godly men and women, and then you send them back with mom and dad. So that's a wonderful thing. But uh, just give our grandparents a hand one more time, if you would. <laughs> We're so grateful for all of you. And uh, we're going to go to the next part of the service. It's going to be a little bit different today, the way we're doing things. But uh, believe me, we're still going to, like I said, we're still going to take time to honor the Lord. But we're going to talk about missions today. This is Mission Sunday. Normally it would have been last week, but we uh, pushed it back a week. But this is Mission Sunday. And this is actually the last opportunity that you have to give for, the, um, for this giving year. That's what the Go Rally is going to be on Thursday, or on Tuesday rather, excuse me, don't let me say Thursday, some of you will show up there on Thursday. On Tuesday, the Go Rally will be at 7 o'clock, that will be at New Beginnings Worship Center on 17A, and it's a time where we just kind of come together and the churches uh, say what their church was able to do as far as for missions, and we celebrate that, we talk about some of the things that are going forward in missions uh, in the coming year and all that. If you, as you give uh, for your Go offering today, if you possibly don't have it today and you're going to have it uh, later on this month, you can still give all the way up until the 30th of September. So all you have to do is just mark your envelope or your Venmo as a uh, go offering and we'll make sure it gets to the right place. To date, we have collected a little under $12,000 for missions, which I think that you need to give yourselves a hand for what the Lord is going to do with that. Amen. Uh, we don't have the number of what we gave last year, but uh, we do know that we're wanting to make a difference on the mission field. We're wanting to be able to reach people that are never going to be able to come to this sanctuary. We're wanting to be able to tell people about Jesus Christ that they will never know where Bono, South Carolina, or even Macedonia, South Carolina is. They've never heard of Oak Grove. They've never heard of you, but we want them to hear about Jesus. And so uh, our ushers are going to come here in just a moment. And they're going to uh, receive the offering, uh, our last go offering for this giving year. And then we'll start up again in October. Uh, so if our ushers will come. We got Riley and Jacob, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she answered for me. So there you go, darling. And then Jacob is coming. I actually, funny story, um, I was trying to text Jake about something. And I, I texted him and asked him if he could help us or uh, with, uh, put in the blessing box and all that kind of thing. I never heard back, and I thought, man, what a jerk. And um, <laughs> I'm kidding. I didn't think that. Uh, but uh, then come to find out, I didn't text Jake. I text Jacob. I didn't even know I had his number. But I shot him a text. But he didn't respond. And he probably would have done harder work than the rest of us that were there. He, he would have been the one driving the tractor, Russell. He, you know he would have. He would have been, I got this. I got this, brother. Anyway, but, uh, but they're going to come by, and they're going to receive the go offering today. What I ask is just that you give what you are able. We, we don't do this. I know that they give out awards and all that kind of thing, and that's, that's great and wonderful, but I don't want you to give to missions because you're wanting to receive recognition. I want you to give to missions because you're wanting somebody to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to give to missions so that somebody in a far off land is going to be able to hear that Jesus Christ not only loves them, but died on the cross for their sins and that they can be with him 
forever if they'll just give their life over to him. That's why we give. And we won't know the, the impact that we make until we are in heaven and until we get to see those people face to face. So I just ask you to give what you're able. And I know the Lord's going to bless it. And I know that God is going to bring those into the kingdom of God because of the seed that you sow today. I'm going to ask uh, the very right Reverend Brother Cheryl Orvin, if he would, to pray over our offering uh, this morning, and then please give as you're able. Amen. God bless you as you give today. everything that you're doing for missions and like I said we know the fruit is going to come from this amen and uh, I want to call up at this time like I said we're doing things a little bit different as far as our order of service and such today but I want to call up at this time the family of Miss Delaney Deanne Teasler is it Delaney or Delaney uh, Delaney sounds more southern but anyway. so it's just me Tony and Sonny are the only ones uh, and we'd like for Delaney to come too, if that's at all possible. There she is. Let me tell you, one of the, the great joys that a pastor has is being able to dedicate a baby. Um, first of all, because it means that I have to hold the baby. And so I don't even have to ask. They, I mean, they just, they just got to give her to me. But, uh, but then also just the whole idea of um, a family that is, is uh, bringing up this child and uh, going to bring up the, the child to know the Lord and what an important thing that is. And I know we've got to wait for Tanya. She's coming. I had to give her a minute to do the missions. But there she is. All right. Here, I'll move this way some so we can all just kind of get more centered. But, uh, yeah, don't get, be careful of that. So, anyway. Hi, Tanya. You can come on up with us, too. Oh, 
here he comes. Come on, buddy. You might as well. So, I mean, honestly, I think it'd be easier to get the people that are not related to her to come up here and then the rest of y'all to stay out there. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. The Bible also says in Psalm 127, 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And as we read in that psalm, as we read in Psalm one, uh, 127, we see where it begins to talk about children being the heritage of the Lord and all that. So we know that we're not talking about a physical house, we're talking about a home, a household. And unless the Lord is the one who is building that house, you are building on the foundation of the word and all that, unless that's happening, then there's not a lot of hope for that home. There's not a, ho- a lot of hope for that, uh, those children to be raised up to know God and, and to know that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. And what I want to do is I've got a beautiful little rose, not as pretty as she is, but I've got a beautiful little rose here that I want to present. And you've seen me do baby dedications before. I've actually dedicated quite a few kids. Y'all just keep them coming. Uh, Josh, Bell, thanks. But anyway, uh, but I always talk about with the rose. And I talk about the fact that uh, it's a beautiful flower. It's got a lovely fragrance. I talk about how, you know, it's, it's a symbol of just beauty. But one of the things about a rose is the thorns. And that we've got to remember that when taking care of that rose, when, when tending to that rose, that sometimes there's going to be some thorns that you have to deal with. I remember when my dad used to, um, used to grow some roses and he'd come in the house and his arms would look like he just went through a cheese grater because of all the thorns. And so there's going to be hard times. There's going to be times when, when the, ch- the children are not going to just be just that happy, oh, look how wonderful they are. They're a heritage of the Lord. And you're thinking that maybe that they're a punishment from the Lord. No, I'm kidding. You don't get to that point. But, you know, there's going to be times when it's going to be difficult. But the thing is, as long as the Lord is one building the house, as long as, as the home is grounded on the Word of God, then it's going to be a success. And it's going to grow, and it's going to be something beautiful. So I'm going to swap with you, if you don't mind. I'm going to hand you this rose. And if I could take her, please, and hopefully she won't scream or hurt me or cry or, no. I haven't, now listen, I haven't had a child throw up on me yet. You hear that? Don't be the first. She's got the hiccup, so now I'm a little bit nervous. But but I've got a couple things I just need to say to the family and then uh, something I need to say to the congregation. First of all, family, do you promise to raise her in a way where she will know Jesus Christ and she will walk in the love and admonition of him. Amen. All right. And you promise to make every resource available to her so that she can know exactly who her Savior is. Church, I want to ask you, do you promise to continue to pray for this child and to be an example of what a godly person is supposed to be so that she can walk the path she's supposed to walk? Thank you. I appreciate that. And she does too. I want you to stretch your hands this way. We're going to pray. And then I'm going to give this beautiful child back over to her mama. But we're going to pray blessings upon her. And we're going to pray that the Lord will always let her walk in a path where she can grow closer to him. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for this great treasure that I hold in my arms today. Lord, I thank you for the way that you have blessed this family with this beautiful child. And Lord, I count it a supreme honor to be able to stand here as we dedicate her back to you. God, this child, you have given this child to this family to bring joy into their lives, to be, to be a, a happy uh, moment in their lives, Father. But Lord, we want to turn this child back over to you because we want her to grow to know you as her Lord and Savior. We want her to grow to have a love for you to have a desire for you to be in her heart and in her life. And Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus that you'll keep your hand of protection upon her all the days of her life. I pray, God, that you will put inside her a desire to know you. Lord, I pray that she will grow to become a great woman of God and that all that see her will see Jesus Christ shining through her. And Lord, I pray for this family that you will help them to be the example that they need to be. God, that you will help them to raise her 
in a manner where she will know that Jesus Christ is Lord of her life. God, help her in all walks of her life. We pray for success and prosperity. We pray for health. God, we pray for peace and harmony in her life and in the life of her family. And we give you glory and praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Way to go. Way to go. You didn't throw up on me at all. I appreciate that. All right. Can you give Ms. Delaney her first hand, please? Bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bless you. All right. You all can uh, go and be seated. You can be seated too, brother. You want to help me out? I'll give you my notes. We'll see if they listen to you better than me. Bye, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See ya. Now, why ain't y'all that happy to be here? That's what I don't get. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you to the family for giving me that honor to be able to, uh, to dedicate her. And, and church, you said that you would pray. You said you would lift her up and that you would show her a godly example. And that's what I expect of you. All right, we're going to do that as, as all of our young people continue to grow in Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? And I'm going to open up with prayer, and then we're going to go to a time of praise and worship. And I know you say, open up with prayer. We're already, you know, 20 minutes in. Well, that's all right. We can still pray. It's all right. We prayed before service, so it's all good. But we want to make sure we take some time to honor the Lord today. Amen? Let's just lift up our praise and our worship to Him. Let's glorify Him because He's worthy to be praised. But let's pray first and just dedicate this service to Him. Father, we come to You thanking You, Lord, for this opportunity to be in Your house again. And God, I know that we've taken care of some business, but God, we also want to make sure we're taking care of the Father's business as we are in this place today. Lord, I pray that your, your presence will just descend upon us in this house. As we lift up our praise, as we lift up our worship to you, God, would you just allow your presence to just fill this place, to fill this house today in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm praying that you would just minister mightily to your people and through your people, God. Lord, that you would just do a mighty work in us us as we give ourselves over to you father and lord as we receive prepare to receive this uh, morning's tithe and offering i pray father that you will bless it in abundance that it will be used for the kingdom of god for the souls to be one to the kingdom of god father and lord we just thank you and praise you for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do in the wonderful name of jesus we pray amen Amen. Amen. If our ushers would come, and we're going to receive this morning's tithe and offering as we go into a time of praise and worship. And so let's worship as we give, let's worship as we sing, and let's lift up our hearts and our voices unto the Lord today. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow.
a moment and just thank the Lord for reaching down and touching your heart that day for changing you and making you a new creature father we thank you for the way that you have changed us God we thank you for the way that you reach down and you touch us and you bless us God Lord, we thank you that you can take us from a place of depression to a place of celebration. We thank you that you can take us from a place of sin to a place of victory. God, we thank you for the way that you just reach down your hand and you can make us new creatures. And we glorify you and thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Remain standing if you would. I'm going to ask our children that are going to Children's Church if they can uh, go ahead and be dismissed at this time. Y'all just stand right there and we'll pray. And then you guys can be dismissed to Children's Church. Like I said, just remain standing. We'll go right into the Word after the kids are, are dismissed this morning. Father, I thank you for each one of these children. And I thank you, Lord, for what we said earlier, that if we train up a child in the way they will go, they, when they're old, they won't depart from it. And we know, Lord, that that Word will stay with them all the days of their lives. And Father, we want to build this house not just our, our personal homes, but God, we want to build Oak Grove on a foundation that is a foundation of the Word of God. And Lord, that's only going to happen as we sow the Word into these children. I pray that you'll be with them, be with the teachers and the helpers as they uh, give instruction today. And we glorify you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give our, hands, our, our kids a hand as they go to Children's Church today. And like I said, if you'll just remain standing, I've got one verse I want to read before I get into my sermon today. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 8. Isaiah 55, verse 8. We have probably heard this verse one way or another or heard bits and pieces of it. But I just want to read it to you today for what I'm going to be preaching about. The word says in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, and your ways are not the same as my ways. Father, we thank you for your ways. Though we may not understand all the time, though we may not get it all the time, I thank you for your ways, because your ways are righteous. Your ways are perfect. Your ways are going to bring us where we need to be. And we praise you for that. I pray that you'll be with me as I bring the word today. Open up the hearts and the minds of the listeners that they may receive, those that are online, those that are in the sanctuary, and we will give you glory, praise, and honor because only you are worthy of it. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. I want to speak to you today for just a little while about the walk back down the mountain. The walk back down the mountain. Now, whenever we're talking about uh, figuratively as far as our, our travels in this earth, as far as our, the walk that we have with Jesus Christ, whenever we come to the mountain... We consider that to be an obstacle. We consider when we, when we come to the mountain that that's a, a rough thing. As a matter of fact, there are songs even about it in, in uh, Christianity. There are, are songs out there. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a black gospel song that said, I'm coming up on the rough side of the mountain. Anybody ever heard that? You know, coming up the rough side of the mountain because there ain't no smooth side. You know, there ain't no, ain't no ski lifts or anything like that, right? Uh, I know Jason Crabb has a song that says, that, that's no mountain for a climber. And it's all good and well for us to be able to say, yeah, we've climbed mountains before and we're going to climb them again and all that. But in our walks with God, when we come to the mountain, it's always seen as an obstacle in our path. It's something in our way. It's a struggle. I had posted something on, uh, on social media a couple of years ago, as a matter of fact, and I said, everybody wants to be on top of the mountain until they encounter the climb. I have no problem being on, on the top, top of Mount Everest and looking out and seeing the world from a perspective that you can't get anywhere else on earth, but I ain't walking. If you want to helicopter me up there, you're more than welcome to do I'll take a spaceship if I need to. 
you ain't going to get, ain't nobody going to hear Pastor Chris died in a mountain climbing accident. If you do hear that, she did it. <laughs> all right, she did it. Because that, 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 ain't, that ain't Pastor Chris, all right? But we, we always look at the mountain as it's a, it's a symbol of trying. It's a symbol of, of uh, tribulation. It's a, it's a testing time because we've got to get over the mountain so we can continue the path that we're on. And probably one of the best examples of this is in Genesis chapter 22. And I've preached about this passage of Scripture before and uh, where uh, Abraham is told to go to the mountain that God is going to show him and that he's supposed to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. How many of you remember this uh, account in Scripture? And Abraham gets Isaac, and he gets the, the fuel for the fire, and, and he gets uh, the knife, and he gets everything that he needs. He gets, his two, young, or he gets two young men to help him uh, to uh, uh, just make sure and take care of everything while Isaac and Abraham go up the mountain. And while they're going up the mountain, I, Isaac kind of starts to get something, you know, kind of a weird feeling in his stomach. It's like, uh, so, hey, Dad, um, seeing the wood... And, you know, we got the thing to start the fire, and you got your knife there, that nice, shiny, very sharp knife that you had me sharpen and such. Um, you know what? I'm not seeing a lamb. Uh, what are we going to do about that? And Abraham tells him that the Lord himself will, or the Lord will provide himself a lamb for the burnt, uh, burnt offering. And so they get up there, and those of you who don't know the account, let me uh, just go through it very quickly. They get up to the top of the mountain. Abraham has told his son that he's going to, uh, that God is going to provide and everything's going to be fine. Next thing you know, Abraham is tying his son up and is laying him down on the altar and even gets to the point where the Bible says that he stretched forth his hand and took the knife. And it wasn't until that moment that Jesus, because it says the angel of the Lord, and we know that in the Old Testament when it's talking about the angel of the Lord, it's, it's talking about Jesus. I can show you why that is here in just a moment. But where the angel of the Lord speaks out and calls Abraham's name, and Abraham goes, yo, well, I mean, he says, here am I. And, uh, and, and the angel of the Lord said, lay down the knife. In fact, uh, I'll just read out of verse 12. Lay, down, or lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And when Abraham lifted up his eyes, he saw a ram caught in the thicket. And Isaac is going, Whew. that was a close one. And so, uh, you know, obviously he gets his son off of the altar, and then they sacrifice the ram, and then uh, the angel of the Lord says some things. And the reason, let me just throw this out real quickly. We can say that about the angel of the Lord, and that that is, is considered to be Jesus in the Old Testament. It's just that he has not come to earth yet and been named Jesus, so they say the angel of the Lord, because he says, I will bless you. I will do these things. You have not withheld your son from me. And so he is speaking as God, not as a messenger from God, but he's speaking as God. So just thought I'd throw that out there. Let's get back to the sermon now. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we all know this account, and we know that God tells him that he's going to bless his seed and that the, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed and, and all that kind of thing. And, and, um, and it's just going to be an amazing thing because Abraham did what he did. What we don't see in Scripture was the walk back down the mountain. And I was thinking about that the other day, and I thought, what was going through Isaac's head on the way back down the mountain? Because he didn't have the young men with him. It was just him and his dad. And I just think about my children. And if I had taken them and bound them up and laid them up on an altar and grabbed a knife, and I was like, here we go, and all that, and then just at the very last moment, you know, uh, the Lord came in and, uh, with the save and everything was fine. And so I just cut his ropes. And, you know, I don't believe that Abraham went and said sorry about that because he wasn't sorry. I mean, he was, he was doing what he was supposed to do. So I just picture Abraham and Isaac coming down the mountain together and just kind of some silence for a little bit. And as they go a little ways, all of a sudden maybe Isaac goes, <clears throat> So, uh, what was that all about? I mean, wouldn't you? Or would you just be like, man, Dad, that was great. Hope we get to do it again sometime. You know, I mean, can you imagine what was going through Isaac's head 
at the time. Because you've got to remember, it was God that spoke to Abraham, not to Isaac. God didn't say, by the way, I'm going to have your daddy bind you up and put you on the altar and pick up a knife, and he's going to just at the last moment before he kills you, I'm going to save you. But it's going to be a really hectic time and a little bit traumatic. You, you might need some therapy later, uh, all that kind of stuff. But, but you know, don't worry, I got everything under control. He didn't speak to Isaac. He spoke to Abraham. Isaac was clueless what was going through his head on the walk back down the mountain. Now, you might say, what does this have to do with me? We'll get to it here in just a moment. Just bear with me. So I'm thinking about the things that would have gone through my head if I were Isaac. Because I think sometimes we think about the, the characters in the Bible, and I, I say characters, the people in the Bible. I don't want you to think I'm saying that they're imaginary, but I think we kind of, we don't picture them as being like you and I. We don't think of them as thinking the same kind of things that we would think. We kind of put them in, you know, they only have Bible thoughts. They only speak in King James English. You know, they only, you know, everything is, you know, wherefore art thou we going to thy altar of the most high God on this mountain that thou hast seen, blah, 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 blah. It's where are we going. Depending on how old Isaac was, maybe he kept saying, are we there yet? You know, he, he had to think like us. So going down the mountain, he's just been th through this thing. He's not the one that heard from God. Perhaps he was able to hear from God as he was uh, giving the blessings to Abraham. But he's going through this thing, and you know, one of the things that had to be going through his head is, why did he have to do it like that? Have you ever gone through a trial, gone through a test, and you came out on the other side, and you were like, well, God, why did you have to do it that way? You wanted to get my attention. There are way other way, um, a bunch of other ways that you could have gotten my attention. Why did it have to be through this? Why did it have to be through loss? Why did it have to be through me going through this very stressful time? Why did it have to be where I went through this time where I felt like I was about to lose my mind? I was about to, uh, you know, I, I, I almost wanted to just end it all because it was so rough. Why did it have to be that way? Have you ever questioned God and said, why did you do it like that? What's interesting is that when we're coming down that mountain, after we've been through that time of testing, and we begin to question God, why did you have to do it that way? Why did it have to be that my father had to bind me up? You got me all the way to the altar. That wasn't, I mean, you could have, halfway up the mountain, you could have said, you know what, that's far enough, good enough, everything's fine. Why did I have to go through that traumatic experience of actually having my father bind me up? He had to take him and bind him up, and then lay me on the altar and I'm laying there and I see his hand out of, the, out of the side of my eye and I look and I turn and I see him grabbing that knife and he's getting ready to pull it up and getting ready to plunge it into me. Why did it have to get to that point? Wasn't there some place before that God that you could have stopped? Why did I have to go through all of that? Have you ever questioned God when you've gotten to the other end of a trial? Have you ever questioned God when you've gotten to the other end of the test? You say, why did you make me go through all that? Why did you make me struggle in that way? Why did you make me have to go through that time of hurt and pain? I've lost friends in this situation. What's interesting here is that if, if the angel of the Lord physically appeared to Abraham and he spoke these things, because uh, let me just read to you what uh, the angel of the Lord said to Abraham after he had shown himself to be faithful. In verse 15 it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is the, upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. What an amazing blessing for Abraham to receive. But what's interesting is that if Isaac was asking, why did I have to go through all that? Why did I have to go through all that, traumatic, uh, uh, all that trauma? Why did I have to go through that stressful time? His focus wasn't on the blessing, but on what he went through. What he should have done, and, and like I said, I'm, I'm taking some liberties here, and I understand. 
because the scripture doesn't say, and this was the conversation back, I'm just saying I know how humans are because I happen to be one. And I know what I would be thinking. And I know times that I've been through testing. And I know the way that Satan has used the test that I just passed to get my focus off the blessing I just received. There are times when God is going to allow you to go through a stressful time, a difficult time. There are times in your life where things are not going to be all just sunshine and roses. There are times in your life when you're going to get health, uh, health uh, diagnoses, prognoses that are not going to be good. There are going to be times in your life where you're not going to have any money to do the things that you have to have money to do. There are going to be times in your lives when your best friend is going to turn their back on you or wait for you to turn their, your back to them so they can put a knife in the back of you. And what happens is that instead of us looking at what God has, has brought about from it, we focus on what we went through. Can you imagine, how many of you hike? Anybody? Brother Willis? Okay. Brother Cheryl and Brother Willis go every year, I know. Anyway, uh, Ryan didn't raise his hand, but he does, and he makes Rochelle go, and it's wrong. But anyway, if you're going up that mountain, let's say you go to Mount Everest, and you've got your little Sherpa with you and all that kind of thing, and you're going up the mountain, and I don't know how long it takes, it's too long, I'll tell you that much, and you finally get to the top of the mountain, you are at the summit you are at the very pinnacle of the mountain and here you see the earth lying before you in in all of its majesty here you are and can you imagine being at the top of that mountain and then saying man boy that path was rough well i tell you that oh man I, when i twisted my ankle there boy i didn't think i'd be able to make it man, I tell, why does it have to be so why does this mountain have to be so high and why did i even come up here in the first place i should have listened to pastor chris there ain't no reason to be up here on top of a mountain there's that, that's what Google's for. Just Google a picture and then I can see it. You know, and why did I even, can you imagine being at that place of victory and all you can focus on is what it took to get there? Because if all you focus on is what it took to get there, you're not focusing on what God has done for you. Isaac wasn't focusing on the fact, and it says that, that the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, so something tells me that Isaac heard what was going on. And he was kind of, you know, what if he was like, yeah, that's all good and well, but why did I have to get bound up? What would have happened if the ram didn't show up? What would have happened if it wouldn't have turned out good for me? You ever done that when you've been through a trial? And you're focused kind of, instead of what did happen, it's like, well, what if that didn't happen, though? You know, I was in a financial uh, bind and I didn't know what I was going to do and the Lord brought somebody and they, and they gave me an, uh, uh, an offering and that offering covered everything, but what if they didn't come? The fact is that they did. Don't focus on what didn't happen, focus on what God did. Don't focus on, well, what it, it could have been so much worse, it could have been terrible, it could have been horrible. Don't focus on that, instead look at it and say, God, this is what you did and I praise you for it. But can you imagine if Isaac was walking down that, that mountain and here Abraham is and he's excited about the blessings and Isaac's just like, man, if it weren't for that ram, man, but, would, he, would he have actually gone through it? Would dad have actually gone through with it? Would he have really gone ahead and put that knife in me? Would I be dead right now and be a burnt sacrifice? Would he have done that? And the thing is, is that it didn't happen. But the enemy's trying to get him to focus if this was going through his mind, and like I said, I can only tell you what I would have been doing because I, kn I know I would have been taken aback, to say the least. But can you imagine if he was more focused on what if the ram didn't come instead of God provided a ram? And how I know that that's what most humans would say, what most humans would do is because that's the way that we are. God will move and he will do something and we'll say, Phew, Good thing that happened. Can you imagine how bad it would have been if it didn't? But it didn't. God stepped in the way. God provided where it seemed like there was going to be no way. Why do we allow our focus to get off of what God has done instead of what God didn't allow to happen? And you might say, well, I don't do that, Pastor. I, well, then God bless you because the, most of the rest of us do. 
Most of the rest of us get so caught up in our whole little, oh, woe is me kind of an attitude and looking and saying about, look at what we had to go through and look at all the trouble that we went through. And, and you know, I lost this friend, not even realize that God didn't want you to have that friend in the first place because that friend was dragging you down and was trying to get you away from God. Or that you end up losing, you know, I lo- end up losing my job, but you didn't even realize that that job was what you were so obsessed with it that it was keeping you away from the things that God was wanting you to do. But instead we focus on what God didn't let happen. And boy, I'm glad it didn't happen instead of giving him praise for what he did. Now think about the, what Abraham must have been thinking. Think about how Abraham, when he was walking down that mountain, thank you God for providing a way to where I didn't have to sacrifice my son. Lord, I would have given him to you because you gave him to me. And he belongs to you. We dedicated a child this morning. Now, I'm not saying that we need to put that child on an altar. Tony will get you. Tony's a nice guy and quiet and all that, but he, he's going to cut somebody, I know. He, that's what Grandpa's going to do, Papa, whatever. And I'm not talking about us putting a child on an altar, but what I am saying is this, that we dedicated that child. The family came up. We prayed you agreed to pray for the, uh, the child. They agreed to raise that little girl in a godly home and to know in the fear and admonition of God. They agreed to do that, and we've given that baby over to God. That baby belongs to God. The parents and the grandparents and all the rest of the family and the church is entrusted to take care of that baby, but that baby belongs to God. So Abraham's coming down the mountain, and he's saying, I would have given him to you, Thank you for not making me do it. And he focused instead on the fact that God made a way where there seemed to be no way. We know, though, that God, he, he knew that God was going to provide, though. You see in verse 8 of chapter 22, when, when Isaac asks him about the lamb, what does he respond? He says, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. He didn't say God will provide something. He didn't say God will provide a sacrifice. He said God will provide a lamb. I believe that Abraham knew with all his heart, God is not going to give me this and then just have me go ahead and, and, uh, and kill this child and then be without a child again because of all these other promises that he has given. But what I do know is this, is that if I end up having to lose something, I know God's going to uh, replace that with something even greater. If I end up losing something, I know that God is going to still fill in that hole. Don't be worried about if you end up losing your job and what are you going to do? God is going to provide you if you're doing what God is telling you to do now if you lose your job because you're sinning and stuff that's on you but if you lose your job because god has allowed things to happen and they were out of your control and next thing you know you're unemployed that's because god is putting you in a new place so that he can bless you with a new blessing if god is it has somebody in your life uh, if there's somebody in your life and that person uh you have a falling out with them and you never thought you would and it breaks your heart the thought that they don't love you anymore and all that kind of thing if that happens it's okay because god's going going to put somebody in your life that's going to feed into you instead of trying to leech things from you I, I think it's it's hilarious and it's sad all at the same time to listen to teenagers date because when they break up the world has stopped there will be no government anymore we're all going to be living in caves and no, no electricity or anything. I mean, uh, the meteorites are going to start coming and bashing. Other, it's the tribulation, folks. Because Jimmy said he wants to just be friends. How many of you have seen teenagers do that? How many of you remember being a teenager and doing that? Yeah, a bunch of liars up in here. Um, I sincerely doubt that everybody in this room, when they broke up with somebody as a teenager, they were like, well, you know, the Lord's going to provide somebody even better. Obviously, that's not the person that's supposed to be my mate. God is going to provide my... No, it's, why? Why, Jesus? Oh, but I love them. We've been dating so long. It's been three weeks. (laughs) And you know they do. I did. But anyway... But the thing is, if only we could look at it from a biblical perspective when we're at that age, 
You need to do that, by the way. If we could just look at it from a biblical perspective from, from that age, that if God removes somebody from our life, if God allows somebody to be taken from our life, there's a reason for that. Either that person was sowing something bad into our lives, or God's got somebody even greater to come and to be that best friend, to be that, that soulmate, to be that person that's going to feed into you, to be that, that pastor friend, to be that, uh, that church family, whatever it may be. God is going to put something greater in your life. And Abraham knew that. And he said that God is going to provide a lamb for the burnt offering. He knew that God had a plan. Last week, I think it was, where I, I talked about Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. We've got to just trust in the process that God has laid before us and know that if he's leading us, we're going to get right to where we need to be. I wonder if Abraham, as he was walking down the mountain, he said, I'm so glad my faith didn't waver because I heard the blessings that God has spoken. I heard what he said he's going to do through my family, and it's all because I obeyed. My friends, when you're going through testings and trials, which we all do, I mean, I, I, I know some of you have shared with me a little bit about some of the things that you've been having to deal with in your lives. I know that I've had trials that I've had to to deal with and some I, I, I talk to somebody about and some some of them I just kind of keep to myself and because uh, I'm not wanting to bother everybody with it but we all have trials and we all have tests that we go through in our lives there's always every single one of us if you haven't had it yet it's coming every single one of us have been through trials where we felt like we just weren't gonna make it to the end every one of us have gone through tests have gone through struggles where we've said this is it I'm done. I'm not going to be able to get through this. But God always makes a way. And you might say, well, but if God really loved me, would he make me go through all of this? Think about this. If God had said halfway up the mountain, you know what, Abraham, that's close enough. Would it really have shown that Abraham was willing to go all the way and do exactly what God said? Maybe he would have gotten to the top of the mountain and been like, mm, I don't think so. No, we ain't doing this. No, no. God, I thought you were going to stop me, but forget it. I'm not going to sacrifice my son. We're not going to do this. God had to let him get to that point where he had to bind his son's hands, where he had to pick up his son and place him on the altar. And I think it's interesting that the Scripture says he went so far as he stretched forth his hand and took the knife. And that's when God said, now I know. Now I know you've gone far enough. Now I know that you would do what I asked you to do, that you would not withhold your son from me. And I'm not going to get into all the theology of, well, why, did God, why would God do something like that? And does God want human sacrifices? Or that? I'm not going to get into that today. That's not what this is about. What this is about today is about that walk back down the mountain. When we've been through those trials, are we... Are we viewing it the way that we need to view it? Are we looking at it? Are we thinking the things that we need to think? Are we thinking about, God, you know, I don't know why this had to happen, but I'm grateful that it did because that's what got me to here. Are we too focused on what we had to go through? I, I think about what Brother Cheryl has been through in the past, what, nine months or whatever it's been. And I think about the struggles that he's faced. And I think about the victories that he's had. And as he's sitting there, and I know you don't like me talking about you and mentioning your name in public, and so I, please, I hope I'm not embarrassing you. He loves it. Anyway, if he sat there in that chair, and instead of focusing on what God has done, focused on why he had to go through what he went through, he wouldn't be sitting in victory. He wouldn't be able to declare victory because his focus would be on the process instead of on the product. I'm going to give you one more bad example, and then I'm going to... You might say, that's a terrible analogy, but maybe I'm hungry. I don't know. You ever heard of the phrase, uh, don't find out how they make the hot dogs? Don't watch the process? There's a show called How It's Made on the Science Channel, and they will show how different things are made and 
blah, blah, blah. And I've, I've seen the hot dog one. And this big old bat of this pink slurry. You know, looks like some kind of a slime from a Nickelodeon show. And they start pumping it through. And then they end up forming the hot dogs and all that kind of thing. If my focus was on the process, I'd be grossed out. I'd be like, oh, that's disgusting. And maybe, maybe some of you, I know we got a bunch of vegans in here. Um, hopefully not. But maybe some of you don't like hot dogs or whatever it is. I love hot dogs. I, I like them pretty much any way you can make them for the most part. I love hot dogs. I saw the process. But you know what? I also saw the product. And I was more excited about the product than I was about the process. And that's why at the 4th of July, I can eat hot dogs. Or Saturday morning at 2 o'clock in the morning. Or at any given moment, if somebody were to bring in a tray of hot dogs right now, I, I would go out there. I'm not going to eat in the sanctuary, but I would go out there and I would be putting down some hot dogs, even though I've seen the process because my, my focus is not on, well, do you know how they make those? Who cares how they make those? They make them delicious is what they make those. You get a little bit of smoke on there and, I mean, we're going to town, all right? I'm more focused on what comes from the process than I am on the process itself as you go through your trials as you go through your test stop getting mad at god because he made you go through something and instead you need to focus on what god made you go through to get to what you've got and you get to focus on what he's brought to you he's you get to focus on the blessing you get to say i'm the person i am today because of the trials of yesterday but look at what god has made me today or i've gotten to this place today and i'm walking in blessing today and yes i know there was a lot of struggle that I had to go through and I didn't understand it at the time but what I do understand is that God is faithful and that God is good and that God is going to provide what is very best for me what he sees to be my best because he's that kind of a father and I'm thankful for the blessing stop walking down the mountain wondering about what would have happened and instead walk down the mountain and bask in the glory of what God said is going to happen stand with me this morning if you would Glenda, are you still here? If you would just come and just play something, uh, please. I'm not a, a positive thinking preacher. I'm, I'm not one of those that, you know, if, 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 you, if you name it, you can claim it. I'm not one of those that says, there's just such greatness in you that God is wanting to pull out. Now, you know, the greatness is in him. And I'll tell you that until the day I die. The greatness is not in us. The greatness is in Him. It amazes me that He would look at me and consider me worthy to be a vessel. It amazes me that He would look at you and do what He has done for you. Isaac, and like I said, I, I know I took some liberty here, but I'm just thinking like, a person would think. I'm thinking like, trying to think like what a young person would think. Because let me tell you, young people question everything. But imagine if that's what Isaac was thinking on the way down the mountain. All the blessing, all the blessing that God promised Abraham because of his faithfulness. That was Isaac's blessing too. Think about that for a moment. He said his seed was going to bless all the nations. That he was going to multiply. In multiplying, he would multiply, is what he had said. That's what he told Abraham. As Abraham's only son, Isaac, was going to receive that blessing as well. And he could have been walking down the mountain saying, I don't know why God would make me go through this. I can't believe my father would have actually gone through with it and would have actually put that knife in my heart, would have actually burned me right then and there in worship to God. I, there's got to be a better way that God could have make, that made all this happen. Do we know why God made us go through that? Not necessarily. Sometimes we figure it out years later. I've told you before about a church that the Lord had me and Crystal go to and work as an associate pastor. We 
we were not happy about. We both knew we had to go. We had a swimming pool in our backyard, and she was sitting on the deck, and I was in the pool, and we were talking, and she said, man, we're going to have to go over there, ain't we? Yeah. Let me just say, it wasn't this, we were a lot happier to come to Oak Grove. I'll just put it that way. And we were there for nine months. <laughs> and it, a pleasant experience would not be the adjective I would use. There were a couple of times that there were people that were above me at the church that I wanted to send them to go meet Jesus by putting my hands around their neck or baptizing them until the bubble stopped. One of the two. And for years, we scratched our heads and looked up at God and went, what was that about? And it was years later that we finally were able to look at the situation and say, now we see the wisdom of God. You know why it takes us that long to see that? Because his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. But God, I want to take this path. No, you need to take this one. We were going to a doctor's office. At, we both go to that doctor in Somerville, and my wife always goes a different way. And I was like, why don't you just do this? It's a lot straighter. You, you, you got like one turn and you're done. And, but GPS always takes me this way. I'm like, ah, oh, GPS. So we were going there together a couple weeks ago, and I thought, okay, I'm going to put in GPS. And yeah, there's a lot more turns, and it saved me like 15 minutes of driving. And I was like, oh, that's why GPS takes us this way. It actually is saving us that travel time. We do the same with God. God, why are you letting my, my marriage go through what it's going through? God, why are you allowing my kids, you know, because God says, hey, go ahead and do what you want to do. God, why are you allowing my kids to do what they're doing? God, why are you allowing me to go through all this work, this trouble at work? God, why are you allowing this family split to take place? God, why are you letting me go to the doctor and instead of hearing, hearing that I'm healed, why are you making me go through all of this? And I'll be honest with you, I don't know. But I'm not the one that needs to know. He knows. And we can just trust in Him and know that His thoughts are not our thoughts. And His ways are not our ways. But, you know, he, they could have added to that scripture a little bit. They could have said, but His ways are better. But His thoughts are better. You don't have to have all the answers. All you have to know is the one who does. I want you to bow your heads. I want us to pray today. Listen, I don't know about you, but I can tell you right now that your pastor is as human as all the rest of you. And I have the same kind of problems that hit me just like you do. And just because I get up here and preach, and just because I'm, I, I hold credentials in the church, and just because I'm a pastor and I've got the call of God on my life to preach the gospel does not mean that I don't have those times of God what was that all about it doesn't mean I don't go through those times of why didn't you just do this but what I have learned in my many years of being in ministry and my many years of being a Christian is that his ways are way better than mine thoughts he has for me are greater than any thoughts I could even have for myself. And I know that he has a plan for my life and my obligation is just to follow his path and to thank him for what he does. I just want to ask you now, if, if you're in this house and you've been maybe going through some things and you've been discouraged because you've been wondering, well, God, why did you let that happen? Why am I having to go through this time? Why am I having to go through this struggle? Why am I having to, to deal with this sickness? Why am I having to deal with this financial issue? Why am I having to deal with this family issue? God, why, 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 why? In 
Instead, what I want you to do is as we pray, I want you to ask the Lord to help you to take on a mindset of not having to know why, but instead just being still and knowing that He's God. You don't have to have the answers. Now, some of you are business people. Some of you are self-made. Some of you, everything that you've got, you've worked so hard for it, and, and, and I admire you for that. But you know what? One of the hardest things that you have as that self-made person, as that business person, as that, that person that's in charge, one of the hardest things that you have is giving the reins over to God. Taking your hands off, the whole Jesus take the wheel thing, taking your hands off it and saying, Lord, I trust you. So as we pray today, I want you to tell the Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I'm letting go of the controls and allowing you to take over. Father, I know that we have times where we question. I know we have times where we wonder, God, why did you let this happen? Or why are you letting that happen? I know that there are times where we, we sit there and, and we, uh, whether it's self-pity or it's just human nature, we sit there and we say, God, but why didn't you just do this? Lord, it would have been so much easier to meet the need this way. Or God, why didn't you just go this route? How, why did I have to go through all that if you were going to make a way anyway? Why did I have to go through the trauma? Why did I have to go through the fear? Why did I have to go through all those things? But Lord, we need to realize that if we just would have had our trust in you completely the whole time, fear wouldn't have had that effect on us. Despair wouldn't have had that effect on us. That sense of hopelessness wouldn't have been there because you are our hope. Lord, I pray that you will help us instead of focusing on the process to focus on the, the production, the product, what came forth. God, instead of us focusing on how hard of a time it was to get to the top of the mountain, God, I pray that you'll help us to get to that top and stand in victory and enjoy the, the scenery before us. And God, for us to be able to glory in you and to be able to say, God, I honor you because of where you have brought me in a time when I didn't think I'd be able to get there. Lord, if we can get to that place where we can get rid of the self-pity, where we can get rid of that pride, saying that we're better than this. We don't have to go through something like this. We're more important than this. God, I know we're going to be able to bask in victory that comes to us through Jesus Christ. Lord, I know you're going to get us up that mountain. And I know when we get up there, there's blessing. Help our focus to be on that not on the path that it took to get up the mountain. In the name of Jesus. Look, I hope that when I say, when I preach these things, when I, I talk about these things, I hope that none of you think that I'm telling you this because I don't ever go through this, because I don't ever deal with this, and let me show you how this is, because I'm, I'm so much better and so much more advanced in my relationship with Christ. There are many times that I'm preaching sermons because God's wanting me to see something from me. And let me tell you, I have had many times where I have trusted God, and we've gotten up there, we've gotten up the mountain, and instead I was focusing on what God brought instead of what I had to go through. But there have been plenty of times when the enemy got a hold of me got my eyes away. All we can do is what we can to keep our hope in Him, to keep our sight, our vision upon Him, and to let our trust in Him, our faith in Him, be the strength that we need to get us over the obstacle. Hallelujah. Lord, as we dismiss today, I pray, Father, that you'll help us to focus upon what you are doing in us. Not how it's getting done, but what you're doing. We may have hard roads to, to walk, but I also know we don't walk them by ourselves. 
Lord, I pray for blessings and favor to be upon everyone in this house, everyone that's watching online, those that are going to watch later. I pray for blessings and favor to be upon them. I pray, God, that our trust and our hope will be in you all the time. I pray, God, that we will not, we will not worry coming back down the mountain about what we went through. Instead, that we will focus upon the victory that you gave us. Lord, we give you honor and glory. We pray that you'll be with us as we go to our homes. Keep us safe. Keep us always in a spirit of worship to you. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for being here today. God bless you. I pray blessings for you. If you're going to be in the cantata, be here at 5 o'clock tonight. We're going to have a, a great time. God bless you.